So you heard already about uh, pseudo-temporal ordering. Essentially, we want to take static data and want to see what type of dynamics are in there. So let me start very simple. Um, I think this should be working. Maybe do it like this. This is our human, and we want to uh, make an atlas out of that. So let's take a few cells from different positions, take them, do a single cell RNA sequencing, and then hopefully embed them in this high dimensional space and learn something about transitions. And these type of transitions could not be learned from a few cells, but if we have many, they might be forming up a, a big blob or maybe some subclusters. Then we do all of our uh, cell type analysis. But uh, if we uh, see some developmental process or uh, 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 something similar, we might see this type of transitions. And these transit tra transitory cells indicate a potential uh, 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 dynamic underlying process that we have maybe sampled in, uh, due to astrochronicity, and thereby we can uh, estimate uh, some type of dynamics. And these things could be, for example, done by uh, doing a shortest path or random walk on this thing, and essentially we boil down the big question of uh, uh, learning these dynamics to some type of similarity measure. And I think we heard that quite a few times before. Essentially, we want to start at some point, let's say we know that this should be some type of, 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 of stem cell, uh, like a, a set of, of cells, and then we just want to determine some type of distance away from these things. And that's how we would initially start ordering. Uh, to give you a bit more details, I tried to uh, uh, look into literature and sort of combine uh, uh, different aspects of various uh, uh, algorithms and briefly review these uh, for you as was uh, given uh, the task uh, by uh, Dana and John to me. So I know that a lot of these algorithms have been developed by you guys, so I'm really looking forward to see how you like my simplified classification. So I guess uh, originally, uh, first put up uh, was this, this idea on bulk data for, for microarrays. Just uh, here on, on, on a toy example, we have this Swiss role of development uh, statically uh, observed. You just fit a min span tree uh, in Euclidean distance, and you, you can see now that you sort of unroll this, this thing. And there were some more fancy uh, versions based on this algorithm, but I think the, the first impact in the single cell field have been made on, on, on site of data with uh, a spade where you have been doing some type of clustering and then arranging these clusters again in a cell type hierarchy. And then in particular here uh, by, by uh, a Wanderlust, where you do uh, take a new Nearest neighbor graph and, and, and consider constrained uh, uh, shortest uh, 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 paths along uh, this uh, uh, walk and thereby uh, learn a first pseudo temporal order. On single cell RNA seq, again based on nearest neighbor graphs, I think uh, Co, Co, Co Chopnell and, and, and colleagues was uh, first putting this forward in a dimension reduced version, again uh, going back to uh, min span trees and trying then uh, to, to unfold uh, this, this type of process. They has uh, recently followed this up with, with a, a version that doesn't uh, need this dimension reduction, but sort of learns this dimension reduction in initially uh, sort of at the same time with the tree, with a thing called DDR tree. Uh, Dana again come up with this fantastic name. I don't know how you pick up these names, Wanderlust and Wishbone, it's really nice. Uh, where, where she extends on, on, on Wanderlust and, and essentially has, has sort of a follow-up uh, way of, of, of determining these, these branching points. And uh, we have been uh, doing a related approach, but not based on shortest walks, but on an average of, of random walks. And all of these, I guess you could summarize about uh, uh, under the theme of, of, of working on a, a subgraph structure and doing manifold dimension reduction. Related, yeah, and I guess I should also uh, mention a slice, another method along these lines. Maybe more simple, but nicer to, 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 to understand are things that are purely based on, on dimension reduction and first going to the cell type. So these were really just uh, doing first clustering and then trying to, to uh, uh, jump between uh, close by clusters. So estimate some tree based on that. We heard about uh, Dominic's work, STEM ID, I think it's a follow up. Uh, of that uh, in, in Alex's lab, where they have been determining the clusters and sort of uh, 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 connecting adjacent clusters and learning about transitions. T-scan, similar method, as well as MPATH, and I won't go into details with that. Just quite recent work, which you might not have seen. Uh, this is some topological type of data analysis, which again has sort of a more fancy way of, of, of collecting clusters and also uh, learning at the same time the particular embedding. There have been a series of uh, 
early probabilistic models uh, to, to work this out. I think uh, we, we, uh, so, so we started uh, with some type of GBLVM, uh, just visualization. Uh, there's a 1D version from uh, Wright and Wernish, and I think you just saw this uh, GP fades from, from Sarah, Sarah already uh, in the morning. I kind of like these Bayesian approaches because you could also at the same time quantify already the uncertainty of, of the estimation which I think for all kinds of downstream analysis would be really nice sort of in a, at least a more complete pipeline to take into account. Astonishingly successful are ideas that just do dimension reduction based on PCA or, or diffusion maps and then find already one of the components or, or sort of a linear combination of components to already giving you a very nice unfolding of your uh, a pseudo temporal or in parts also spatial uh, process. Uh, you, you, you saw this work here from uh, Aviv's lab, where uh, I think in this case it was just a, a set of, of, of PCs taken from first and, 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 and second direction, and you saw already this very nice split by informed selection of PCs. Similarly, in this case, a pseudo-spatial coordinate was, was trained by, again, going in dimension reduction and then choosing a, a direction by informed uh, a selection of uh, of a set of genes uh, that, were, that were changing, then you're aligned uh, projected along this way. And quite recently, uh, uh, um, a paper from um, Moon et al. just uh, in BioArchive, where this visualization was learned as a dimension reduction, and you can then uh, build this uh, on top of your tree uh, branching identification method. Then just uh, a, a bunch of additional ideas. Scuba was just uh, uh, trying to, to learn uh, with actual time points uh, some type of bifurcation structure. Uh, similarly, this uh, idea of clear minimum patterns, which I think would be quite nice uh, uh, for, uh, for, for also working on, on image tracing data where, where cells were compared by the number of, of patterns or of, of, of particular uh, specific phenotypes that were acquiring. And uh, a, a recent work based on, on an extension of, of k-means to, to, uh, to a projective space to identify branching regions with k-branch clustering, as well as many others, which I guess don't say much in detail, except for the fa fact that here you can actually have additional prior information put into that. So we have a whole bunch of algorithms that are out there, and I think for human cell atlas it would be a good idea to see which uh, features we want to take from which one. Before that, though, let me just briefly say that there's, of course, many possible applications. I think over the, the morning you saw already a few. Let me just point out that once you have visualized these type of dynamics, you can uh, project even just uh, in, in, in this type of, of process already uh, uh, localization of, of, of various uh, uh, markers, in this case uh, for fetal neocortex development, here for uh, for a developmental hierarchy of tumors uh, across different uh, individuals where you see the differences between the individual tumors or and that's maybe quite interesting not only for single cell uh, sequencing data but also for other type of data let it be, be side of as i mentioned in the beginning but in this case also an extension of of, of wanderlust uh, uh, from dana together with the pac lab i believe uh, to morphometry where you could also unfold then from a static picture uh, dynamics of cell cycle I think whenever we come up with a method, it would be a good idea to see and to ask ourselves what we can actually learn. And it turns out, obviously, if our, if, if our process is in some type of steady state, you might not be able to learn something about growth or something like that. So I think uh, it's clear that if we have cells without any dynamics going on, our particular ordering method should not try to find some type of arbitrary direction in this basin, but ideally should, should sort of uh, 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 collapse that to the same uh, pseudo time. So I guess as a possible definition, whenever we have these stochastic situations, uh, a good way what a pseudo time should determine is this average stochastic, uh, so the stochastics of, of the dynamics averaged out deterministic part of, 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 of that particular transition. Let me maybe visualize this in, uh, in, in, uh, within just one simulation a bit more detail. For this, we. Uh, made a simulation, Gillespie type, of two, two transcription factors that are mutually repressing each other, very common motif in development. And once this, this factor G21, then a, a downstream cascade was turned on where again this battle uh, is, 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 is raging. And I just show you those set of, 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 of cells where first G2 and then G6 one. So you see first G2 goes up, then G6 goes up, and the other ones go down. 
And you see, because of this, this battle here being purely stochastic, we cannot tell a priori at what time point actually this, this battle exits and, and starts going. So this time, this actual real time, we will never be able to estimate from a snapshot like this. Instead, we have to average out this stochasticity and only learn this deterministic part rolling down. And mathematically, what you would do is you normalize out by the density of staying in this particular state. We call this universal time, and if you apply to this universal time, or some type of pseudo, so, so, so this was universal time applied to real time, and if you apply pseudo-temporal estimation to just snapshot data, you get exactly that picture. So this is the only thing we can estimate. We can never estimate stochastic exiting except for uh, us having additional information such as, as, as real time. So that's sort of the, the, the minimal thing we can do. I think, I'm sure most of you counted the number of algorithms I showed. 25 or so, I guess, I hope I did it correctly. So obviously there's a lot of things that, uh, and each of these algorithms is a set of own parameters, so how do we actually choose uh, one uh, to do and how do we evaluate those? And I think very common is just visual inspection and I think it's also a very good start. But of course, as follow-up, you could try, if you really have time labels, you could try to correlate your, your, your pseudo-time with time labels and see if there's some structure as, as, as sort of a means and potentially as a benchmark or, or for, for, for the hackathon to give a, some, some type of uh, really way to evaluate different methods. You could look at a, a robustness uh, of the re reconstruction or, and I think this is very promising, uh, and, and there's some, some, some very nice ideas coming along this line. We could also take uh, real genetic uh, information. For example, here, a, a method by, by Jan Philipp Juncker uh, at the time from, from Alex von Udenaden's lab, with the, which he called scar trace, where they have genetic scars, and you can actually learn about cells that are downstream from others, and you want to have them then, if you can combine this with transcriptomics, also be on the downstream side. Um, similar. This uh, again very nicely uh, named uh, Gestalt genome editing of synthetic target arrays for lineage tracing, uh, uh, an approach recently published where you want to where, where you essentially have some type of barcode uh, uh, added to your particular cell, roughly 10 or so CRISPR targets, where you then end up with roughly 1,000 or so different states that over time can actually accumulate also deletion and insertions. And by those deletion and insertions that happen more or less randomly, you can actually then do some type of reconstruction of lineages, where, where of course each of these stops might not only be a single cell, but a whole bunch of cells, and you only see then uh, these steps when you actually acquire these things. And then, in this way, you can actually reconstruct whole, uh, uh, whole uh, zebrafish embryo average uh, traces. And I think an interesting point is how these then actually relate to uh, our, our pseudotemporal ordering. And I think you've seen this, this plot quite a few times before. I don't want to go into detail for that. just want to link to the question that whenever we want to unfold continuous phenotypes from all of these other directions that were mentioned before by, by uh, Arif, I think these type of factor models might be a very good way to go along this line. So let me wrap up and just uh, finish with uh, two uh, points for discussion maybe uh, later for today. I think interesting directions where these, these methods could be heading would be non-tree structures, Uncertainty modeling, I mentioned that before. I think inclusion of additional information, potential bulk, but also real time, or also lineage tracing information. I think uh, noise models haven't been tackled as well as they have, for example, for differential expression. And I think also just differential expression along branches in contrast to differential expression uh, for clusters is not yet as developed as it could be. Particular identification of, of driver genes at points should be more than just plotting the sort of the, the most expressed gene. And uh, I think a combination with lineage tracing is the way to go. Last slide for that. I think this is a general idea of how uh, these, these algorithms are set up. Subset selection, dimension reduction, measure distance, and potentially detect branches. And we could sort of juggle one feature from one method, put it into another. And I think some type of evaluation would be excellent for, for the atlas. Then have some tuning. We should determine what type of output we need link this to tracing, and in the end, of course, apply this uh, to the data in the HCA portal. Thanks very much. Thank you for the talk. This time we have time for one question. Who's the lucky question asker? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, um, over here, Fabian. So, so my question is uh, outside of maybe what you really talked about, but I'm curious about your opinion. 
Um, are there attempts, are you thinking about ways to uh, couple uh, sequence information uh, to uh, lineages and uh, lineage decisions? I mean, you, in the very end, you mentioned identifying genes, which I think is actually a key issue um, to find the molecular decisions which are um, underpinning the um, bifurcations um, that, that you observe to understand really mechanisms which are making functional decisions, but then also there should be a sequence, uh, it should be linked to sequence which read out uh, transcription factor um, concentrations, etc. So how is, are there attempts to do this? So I think there are, there, are, there are two answers, in particular in model organisms, where we can actually do genome editing. Of course, we could combine this, uh, such as Philip is starting to do this, uh, with some type of, let's say, these, these cars and transcriptional readouts. Of course, this wouldn't scale as much, but for mechanistic uh, uh, analysis, that would be interesting. I think more promising is, uh, or, or sort of similarly promising, uh, is a combination with uh, additional sequence readouts, such as single-cell ataxic, where actually a lot of these type of uh, um, particular decisions in, in development might be more nicely reflected uh, on, on, on accessibility of chromatin. So I think, uh, for example, uh, 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 Jason, Jason uh, Buenrosto, who we, we just saw before co-developed this uh, uh, first single cell taxi uh, uh, assay, has now a data set where he applies this uh, to, to, to hematopoiesis in a rather large-scale fashion and very beautifully recovers a, a lot of these transitions just in the first uh, two PCs. And I think a combination of, of these approaches, although it might not maybe be uh, as, as scalable, uh, could be very promising. Thank you very much to Fabian.